I'm just so thrilled to be here and have the opportunity to talk to all of you a little bit about what's going in, on in the United States around recovery, particularly from the uh, perspective of transforming services, which is one of the themes of the conference. How do we make services that are useful to people um, who are in their process of recovery? Uh, the title of my talk uh, is Transforming Services, Old Baby, New Bath, Old Bath, New Baby, New Baby, New Bath. The notion being here, mixing metaphors perhaps a little bit, about when you throw the bath water out, you obviously don't want to throw the baby with it. But, you know, is it an old bath? Is it a new bath? Are you actually doing anything different? How are you going to incorporate what worked in the past that was useful and get rid of the things that didn't, bring in useful new things, and make sure you don't bring in new things that you don't want to have? So, um, so the whole process of transforming services, I think, is an ongoing dialogue between what we have been doing, what we imagine to do, and what we can figure out how to do in the moment. Terry used the metaphor of a journey, and I'm going to do that too. I've had a lot of time to think recently. Just recently, I managed to walk the West Highland Way with my family. Now, has anybody done that walk before? Yeah. One person. <laughs> There's a reason a lot of you haven't done that walk, because it's really a challenge. <laughs> um, and it starts, um, it starts in, in Mulgai, um, which is not at all how that's spelled. In, uh, just outside Glasgow, and you walk 96 miles essentially due north. Um, it essentially looks like that middle picture um, when you look down the whole way. There's your foot, <laughs> and every single step you count. Um, and then you finally get to the end in Fort Williams, and it is, um, it's an extraordinary experience to have had that, uh, the capacity to do this. Um, it, it is a, um, it, the metaphor of the mountain and climbing the mountain, having a view. While you're still at level ground, once you've done something like this, you know that you've done it. You certainly feel it. Um, and it is, uh, it's a process. It's a process of feeding the soul. Um, thankfully, uh, the weather was glorious. What can I say? I didn't expect that. Um, this is a current cartoon in the New Yorker magazine which says, OMG, I'm on a journey too. So if you're thinking that this metaphor is being overused, perhaps it is, but still, we are all on a journey. Um, and this journey, I think, involves taking care, right? Um, what, what you... Um, might not appreciate from the notion of walking 96 miles, we did this over a course of seven days, is how much your feet hurt, or at least my feet hurt. I am so pleased that I can stand before you right now because it's been enough days that I could actually stand on my feet and talk to you at this time. For a while, all I wanted to do was sit down. Um, I tried to take care of my feet, but I was not always successful. Nonetheless, I did have some good ministrations along the way to uh, bandage them up and keep them going. And we stopped every once in a while. I went with my family to take care of ourselves, make sure we had some nutrition. You know, so there was a lot of taking care of ourselves in the, in the notion that um, Terry was talking about of self-care. Um, and you learn certain things. Um, this says, if you laugh at all of God's jokes, he's never going to learn what's funny. Um, <laughs> You begin to appreciate the, the ironies of life, right? The fact that most of this walk, which is absolutely glorious, right, I spent thinking about my feet. You know, you learn how to appreciate the mundane and the glorious all at the same time. Um, but we had services. We had services to help us do this walk. Critically, um, there were... Um, uh, places like the Drover's Inn, where we were able to stop and, you know, rest and, 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 uh, and sleep. And... Somebody has set it up so that your bags, right, instead of having to carry everything with you, you can have it transported from place to place to place. So um, if I had not had that, if I'd had to actually carry a full bag, I don't think I actually would have completed this trip, right? So the services are really critical. Um, and services have to be transformed. I don't think I would have stayed in the rough conditions of this, uh, in the upper, uh, your upper left-hand corner there, in the rough conditions of what would have formerly passed as a way station um, way up there in the Highlands. It's, you know, it's cold, uh, foreboding, it's not what I'm gonna wanna do, but the, uh, but the new hostels and various kinds of uh, bed and breakfasts and things along the way make it possible to do this walk, okay? So, the point of all that was to talk about the idea that if we're going to do the journey of recovery, 
then there are going to be way stations. There are going to be people who help you carry your bags. There are going to be people who are going to help you at particular moments while you help yourself in that process. Because as Terry said, not only is the initiation of the journey of recognizing what it takes to start the journey hard work, and there was a lot of planning to do in order to make any of the things I just talked about happen, but the actual day-to-day -day performance of that journey is super difficult. You have to get up in the morning, and while there are tremendous rewards, I don't want to downplay the rewards, you still have to maintain yourself and keep going, and you need people to help you do that. So that is the framework that I'm coming from. I don't want to be accused of um, you know, claiming that recovery is in any way what professionals do or people who are service providers do. We don't do recovery. All we do is help you on that journey to the degree that we know how to do it. It turns out that helping people is really, really, really difficult. This, if I was going to teach one thing to medical students and other health professionals, I would say your notions about how easy it is to help people are completely wrong. It is really hard to figure out to help people in the way that they want to be helped at the moment that they need to be helped. That is a very difficult task, and you are signing up for that. This is not a simple thing. This is not simply the Good Samaritan finds somebody, puts them on the donkey, takes them to the next inn. The, inn ter the innkeeper may say, well, I'm only going to put them up if you pay an extra 50 bucks. You know, I'm only going to, the, the person might say, I don't want to go in that direction. I want to go in the other direction. Um, it is not a simple process to help people. And the question that I got when I was working for the federal government as the uh, medical director for this, uh, something called the Center for Mental Health Services, when I was talking to professional organizations and uh, various mental health uh, providers, mental health care providers, the question that I got asked when I talked about all the attitudinal changes that had to happen with recovery was, okay, we get it. We understand that recovery is about helping people use their own capabilities and capacities to tap into those capabilities and capacities to do the work that they have to do to recover. And our job is to help them do that. <coughs> our job is not to fix people. Our job is not to cure people. We get that, right? But what do we do differently tomorrow to make that happen? How does that actually show up in our day-to-day -day practices, in the inpatient units, in the emergency settings, in the ongoing outpatient clinics. How do we do something different that makes this really work? And what do I keep doing? If I'm going to do something different, good, are there things that I should keep doing? How do I know what those things are? <laughs> so, um, you know, in the, in the view of the, the past is another country, there's nothing new under the sun, and there is good and bad and everything. I want to just do a quick review of what we have done in the past to try to help people and what have been the dilemmas that we've faced. Moral therapy, moral treatment was really focused, the whole notion of the, of the Tukes and various other folks was actually focused on the idea that if you give people a very strict discipline, Pinnell as well, strict discipline of good, wholesome living, right, in what they called therapeutic communities, or what we would call therapeutic communities, that people will thrive. And that was true. There is an important role in which opportunities and structure allow people to do that journey of recovery. However, it's also equally possible that your social structuring for people becomes oppressive, becomes um, social control, rather than just the structure of, uh, of people uh, moving forward in their lives. Similarly with psychotherapy. Psychotherapy has incredible powers to help people develop insight and capacity to think about how they are living their lives and what's happened to them and their experiences that are very profound and very useful. At the same time, there has been uh, a built-in sort of oppression of the expert that somebody else's insight gets supplanted for your own. The notion that you will never be able to know as much about your illness as the person who's your therapist, for example. Um, that kind of oppression has been built in. So there's, there's been good and bad in all these things. Similarly with psychopharmacology, there's the healing power of a tool. Medicine can be a useful tool. Medications can be useful, but you can also easily 
over, overuse them, over rely on them. Um, uh, think of them as a solution to the problem rather than a tool to solving a problem. And similarly, I'm going to argue, and I think Terry raised this issue as well, around the notion of recovery. There's the healing power of the person, which is, I think, essential, important, and a profound insight that we have finally gained. Um, but there's also the high likelihood that the service system, the providers, the state will decide that, well, if it's all about the person, let's just let them do it on their own. Right? We don't need to organize any supports for them. It's all about them doing their own thing. Anyhow, why bother? What, what kind of supports do we need to provide for something that's internally driven? So that's the good and the bad. That's the, um, that's, uh, the past being different than it is uh, what we see today. And, um, and it's the fact that, in fact, all of these things that are good, the healing power of structure, the healing power of insight, the healing power of a medication as a tool, or the healing power of the internal capacity of the person. These things all exist. They've existed in the past. How do we bring them into the, into the future? So where has that taken us in the United States? Um, <laughs> we have launched an initiative. It's been going on now actually for about five years since its inception um, called Recovery to Practice. The notion is that we want to help the various providers of mental health services in the United States be in a position to provide mental health services that support recovery, that are focused on helping do that personal journey. And as you'll see, we have a number of organizations that have been engaged with us in this process. I'm going to speak specifically about the American Psychiatric Association and its work with something called the American Association of Community Psychiatrists, um, which is what I am. I'm a community psychiatrist. Um, the other organizations have their own um, activities, and we are um, in the process now of starting to bring these, all these activities together. Um, so that they are fused and begin to uh, function in a team sort of uh, a team sort of per um, pattern. For the psychiatric world, the goal of recovery practice was to familiarize psychiatrists with the principles of a recovery-oriented practice, and what that what the benefits of that would be for both the persons being served and for the providers, uh, and then to develop the tools, the things that actually help people know what it is they're going to do differently tomorrow and what it is that they're going to keep doing that's the same. We have uh, nine modules. All of this stuff is accessible on the, uh, on the internet. Um, so if you go to uh, Recovery to Practice and uh, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, you can pull these materials up. Um, we have um, a whole uh, set of modules which are um, a multimodal, um, you know, so there's video, there's discussion, there's uh, lecturing, there's a whole sort of approach to helping people begin to understand these aspects of what recovery is. Importantly, um, you know, uh, one of the things Terry says, we have to learn how to think out of the box. And clearly to incorporate recovery into practice, we have to think out of the box. At the same time, I've already talked about how important a little structure is for people in a journey. So one of the things that we've been trying to struggle with, and I'll come to this in a little bit, is how do you incorporate some structure, some identity? If I say I'm a recovery-oriented psychiatrist, you have some idea about what the heck I do when I do my work. You know, if I want to have that kind of approach, that's the kind of doc I'm going to go see because they're a recovery-oriented uh, doc and I know what that means. So part and, and, and a major part of the work that we've been doing is to go beyond the notion of the principles and the ideas of what recovery is to actually starting to explain how that makes a difference in day-to-day -day practice. So these modules, first there's the introduction that go through all the things I just said, essentially. Um, and, then, um, and then we have various elements, talking about engagement and a welcoming environment. That's the whole notion about how do you actually begin this process of um, making help feel like it is something that pulls you in, that allows you the opportunity to participate, that gives you the opportunity to make decisions about what level of participation you're going to take as a service seeker um, at that particular time with people who care about you, with people who are clearly manifestly engaged in trying to think about how to be helpful to you. 
um, person-centered planning and shared decision-making is really about the notion that we've sort of been hitting on pretty hard here, which is that in order for the healing capacity and capabilities of the person to be involved or engaged in their own personal journey of recovery, it has to be engaged in the process and planning of what they do in terms of treatment or other kinds of activities in that process. So the whole notion of shared decision-making, person-centered planning, goal attainment, all of that kind of stuff is really essential and a critical element of what we see practice being about. Um, peer supports, right? Being engaged with people with lived experience to help us help folks begin to understand what the journey's about, the profound wisdom that the um, recovered community and recovering community has developed on its own, those kinds of resources become essential to incorporate into the practice so that and, and this involves things like, so if I see somebody psychiatrically to do an assessment of what's going on with them, one of the things that I would also want to make sure happen is that they have an opportunity to talk to a peer. That they have some peer evaluation, and peer connection, peer relationships, peer opportunities, right? And that's not just something that sort of happens, that's actually how I practice psychiatry. I work with peers, right? Role of medication, I've talked about this a little bit. This is a clearly a very topical one and a key one in a notion here is that we're really trying to help psychiatrists and other folks begin to stop thinking about medication as the solution to the problems of mental illness. It does not solve the problems of mental illness. It is at best a tool and very much along the lines that Terry was talking about. It is a tool that if it is helpful and it helps you do the things in your life that help you get where you want to go in your life, then we know that it's doing something useful and you decide, and we decide in that process how to help you decide this, what you're gonna use and how you're gonna use it and how long and in what way you're gonna use medications. Health and wellness uh, focused care. Here, the whole notion, uh, again, Terry's notion mentioned, uh, that he mentioned about the, the brain and the body, the mind and the body. We, we in the United States have historically entirely neglected the health of folks who've got psychiatric challenges just paid essentially no attention to it. And we have mortality rates, early mortality rates, that um, show for that. So we've now really moved to begin to think about how we attend to the medical and the physical and health-related um, lives of people. When I was in residency, I used to give people cigarettes as a reward. Right? People wanted cigarettes, we gave it to them as a reward, therefore they pursued whatever activities they wanted to pursue. But that really doesn't send the kind of message that we want to send. I'm going to try to wrap this up in just a minute here. We're also working now in helping psychiatrists and other folks think about how we help people develop the living skills, the rehabilitation activities, and the natural supports that will allow them to continue in, in community. So it's not just let's discharge people to the street, for example or we don't think about what the connection with the family is, or with the local social clubs, or other activities that people might be engaged in. <coughs> Clearly in the United States and, 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 and here in Britain, we have to think very carefully about how we approach the different cultural approaches that people have, the different ethnicities and ways of thinking about what help is about and what the point of all this is about is really important. So we're also making sure we include uh, culturally appropriate care. And given the extraordinary rates of trauma that anybody who's in clinical practice or has been working with folks and lived, with lived experience know uh, occur, we have to do all this from a trauma-informed perspective. So these are all elements that are going on. A couple of things that we're continuing to work on, and maybe we can, these can come up at later points. The whole notion of risk, safety, coercion, and power is a huge issue in this. Um, how do we go to a position of no force first, but make sure that we use force when it's necessary? because unfortunately there are times when it's necessary. It isn't a permanent state for anybody, but there are points in time when some people really are not safe. Um, and we need to do what we can at that moment to get them through that period. We need to figure out how we're gonna use this whole new information technology and the sharing and organization of information between ourselves, between the families, between the person who's got the uh, uh, desire for service. Um, that whole process is really a very complex one and is still one that we're still negotiating. 
given the fact that knowledge is advancing every day, how do we in, in, incorporate new knowledge into our practice? How do we develop a better way in the United States right now to start a new way of practicing in psychiatry? You are looking at a 20-year timeline to get it incorporated in any way in practice. That's obviously way too long. Um, how do we create opportunities to extend and exercise a person's capabilities and capacities? How do we focus on the relationship? This is something also as Terry, saw, Terry was talking about. All this stuff, this big system that we work in, that we work in here in the States and that you obviously work in here in, in, uh, in Britain, how do we keep that personal interface alive, human, vibrant, connected, compassionate, in the face of the routinization that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis, in the face of the disappointment, because much as I've said about recovery, I also then what a wonderful thing it is, it's also at times extremely disappointing. Sometimes people don't get where they want to get to. Sometimes it takes a really long time. After all, I said it was really hard work, and Terry said the same. It's really hard work. That means at times that there are things that don't go right, that don't go well. How do you continue to persevere? And then in our society, which is so flush with information about bad things that have happened and how terrorized we all are, how do we deal with the ongoing fear that exists amongst ourselves as providers, amongst folks who've got lived experience, and the general public? How are we going to manage this fear in such a way that we don't close down the opportunities for people to recover? In short, what I want to suggest to you, at least from the psychiatric perspective, and this is something that I'm, I'm um, I'm a bit loath to say, but I actually do believe it. We are in the process of reinventing what psychiatry is about. We're in the process of reinventing psychology. We are in the process of reinventing psychiatric nursing. We are in the process of reinventing the whole kit and caboodle of what mental health services are about. Now, I don't want to make that too large a thing because there are some things from the past that we do need to incorporate and we need to keep going and we need to uh, value. The capacity to help people have a structure in their life. The capacity for people to have conversations that are meaningful and insight and help generate insight are really important. The utility of medications that help them as a tool. And then the fact that we can help people find the capacity in themselves to recover. Those are all things that we need to continue and to grow. Our current focus um, does not allow us to really think about the person in those ways, um, in a way that's as helpful as it needs to be. To transform, we need to prepare. We have to really think about how we're going to change. We need to engage in appreciative inquiry. We cannot throw what is good out. People will fight that, and they should. We need to make sure that we are keeping what's good, and we need to talk about what's good, not lose that thread, and be appreciative of that, because that is what brings people into the conversation. We need to introduce recovery-oriented care to the broad audiences, this has to be done in multimodal learning. And critically, um, we have to figure out how we're going to measure things without killing them. And lastly, we have to figure out how we're going to coach people through this process. In the United States, there has been a major initiative by, some, by the, uh, what we call primary care family practitioners, um, you would probably call GPs, um, to reform how they think about what their practices are. They've been on a 20-year uh, effort on this now involving millions and millions of dollars to help people transform their practices. Um, and if you go to the website called TransformMed, right, you'll see um, examples of how they've used coaching to help people achieve what we now call in the United States, because of their efforts, um, uh, personal, uh, uh, person-centered medical homes. Uh, the notion that it is going to be critical that people have access to health homes where they can go and get the wide range of services and access the services that they need to maintain their health and to protect it. How do we coach people in that process? In short, I think that transforming services is the mirror of the recovery journey. Thanks. That's my email if anybody's interested, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you.